Hey guys, Mike, your host of Crushing Your Fear, the show that gets to the root cause of uh, all our crap. (laughs) Kind of drill down, you ask yourself the why questions, why, 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 and usually you end up like, I'm scared, or I don't want to do that. There's some type of fear involved. That's what I think, I don't know. But a lot of other people I have on the podcast say the same thing. So, today we have a, a special guest, Joshua Berglund. He calls himself the world's mayor, right? He's a good guy. He's also a chairman of the uh, Live um, Mana Worldwide Foundation. They're helping the homeless, and they're doing a lot of great stuff. And Joshua's journey has not been uh, a very smooth sailing one. He's had a lot of stuff that happened to him. So I, I said, let's come on my podcast, and let's talk about it. And he agreed, and we got him on. So uh, we had a great conversation. Hey, but first... Have you gone on iTunes or wherever you're listening to? Give us a rating and review. Click on those five stars. Everything's awesome. That's the only way we get it out there. We just got to get our our, our uh, podcast up in the rankings and then more people see it and more people get this great knowledge that we give to you from these fantastic guests we have. It's, it's just unbelievable. Man, I learn something new every time I talk to somebody. It's crazy. But it's good stuff. So uh, let's get to Joshua. Here we go. <laughs> Hey, we have uh, Joshua Berglund. He is the he's the world's mayor, and he's the chairman of uh, Live uh, Mana Worldwide Foundation. Uh, he's done a lot of uh, things. He has a very interesting life, and he's doing a lot of good for people now. And I, I met him on uh, LinkedIn, and I said, "Hey, you got to come on my uh, come on the Crushing Your Fear podcast." He's like, "Yeah, let's do it." So I, I appreciate you. Th- thanks for coming on. May I am blessed to be here. Thank you for the opportunity. That's awesome. Yeah, and and I see that you're. Uh, you mentioned that you were in downtown Minneapolis. I think I see it behind yes, you, and it seems like very. It doesn't seem too active back there. I don't know. <laughs> downtown is em- emptied out. They've had um, like over ten thousand people have lost their jobs here, and wow. believe it or not, the street that you're looking at, right underneath it is where protesters and the police line up uh, several times a week <laughs> and My stand God. off with each other. So they're the still doing that. It's right behind me. Oh, yeah, it's still going on. And you can feel it in the air that uh, it's about to spike up again. Oh, my God. I don't watch the news anymore. I try to just not watch it. I, I watched the debate the other night because I wanted to be entertained, and I was thoroughly entertained by both of them. But that's the only reason why I wanted to watch it. But I don't watch the news anymore. I don't know what's going All I hear is just negative stuff, and I got to stay away from that stuff. You know, I try to do positive, and that's why we do the Crushing Your Fear podcast, to try to take negative stuff and just bring the positive out and help people, especially now. There's a lot of fear going on, all mm. kind like riots and pandemics and all kinds of nonsense, like crazy stuff going on. So... No, I appreciate you coming on. So what I do ask the guests is like kind of give us a history of, uh, you know, where you came from, your journey and, and where you are now. You've had a lot of stuff go on uh, and you've overcome a lot of uh, uh, issues and fear. And, and maybe you can start there. Yeah, sure. Um, and to really try to sum it up and not spend a lot of time on every every little thing, but you know, I was born to an upper middle class family. My mom was Mrs. America. My father was a successful uh, musician. He toured with Ike and Tina Turner and Jerry Lee Lewis. They had a couple top 10 hits. And then he became wow. a successful entrepreneur. And um, But we had that typical on the surface, uh, leave it to beaver family, you know, the, the all American family. But uh, what really the truth was behind behind the scenes, it, it, my father was very abusive and uh, wow. physically abusive with my mother, abusive with me. Um, in a, he was inappropriate with my two older sisters, and I didn't know about it for about twenty years after the fact, after they disappeared. Um, but the, my life started at seven years old when my sisters just up and left with no explanation. I never knew what had happened. The physical abuse uh, started right after that, and then I was molested by started uh, was molested the first time by two men, also at the age of seven. Uh, the age of seven is a very it's a very strange time in my life because that's when a lot of the trauma in my life started. But it's also where I learned how to keep secrets because because of who my family was was we don't talk about what happened 
uh, last night when dad ripped the bedpost off and threw it at mom or when dad choked mom or dad choked me. We don't we don't talk about those things because, mm-hmm. you know, we went to church on Wednesday night and Sunday morning and Sunday night. And, you know, we're the upstanding citizens. And um, but, you know, all of that, those secrets that taught me how to hide. And uh, once I, you know, keeping that anger and that rage and the confusion and the not understanding what had happened to me, the nightmares of being molested, all of that stuff was kept inside. And so it would come out in this rage, this just fiery demonic rage that, you know, sports helped a lot. Like I, I, I don't really think I have that much athletic ability, but I was fueled by this rage that got me a football scholarship and <laughs> Like, and I was a smooth talker. Like I could talk myself out of trouble. Like, I don't think I ever really took a test in school, found a way to get out of high school without ever studying or doing anything. Um, and I don't know what that says about our education system, but nonetheless, I got really used to wearing masks and being able to hide and lie and manipulate. And after my sports career ended, after getting hurt playing football, I got into cheerleading and with, believe it or not, with cheerleading, that's what introduced me to drugs. And drugs were started with ecstasy, ketamine, then cocaine, and then methamphetamines. But that served as an escape in a way that I honestly loved. Um, sex and drugs became my thing. Um, and, and that became a beast that would never be fulfilled. So... With with that um, became came battling my sexuality, not knowing if I was bisexual, not knowing if I was straight. So I would get into these relationships because I was horribly codependent. But then I would get in the relationship and go, "Oh crap, what am I doing?" And then I would become a serial cheater. It. I. I all I can say is this to keep it brief: is that the sex and drugs, the lies and the manipulation, escalated from the age of 19 up until the age of 36, it escalated more and more every year. Um, Was in jail six times and um, for, you know, everything from fighting. Um, The last two visits to jail were over domestic violence, um, cocaine and alcohol fueled fights uh, with an ex-girlfriend. And, um, but finally, you know, it was the sixth time in jail in LA County that I had just gone, what have I done with my life? I grew up with every single opportunity you can imagine. Uh, You know, again, we grew up, I grew up on the country club. I mean, I was a great golfer and, you know, I was a good athlete for, I guess, I mean, I I got a scholarship, so that must've meant something, but I had, I grew up with every privilege imaginable, but trauma and tragedy didn't escape me. And instead of having a voice, instead of letting that, that the secrets out, the truth out, um, I eventually became the monsters that hurt me. And I hurt a lot of people. So I'm very grateful for that sixth time in jail. I remember my mom leaving me in jail. She had an opportunity to bail me out. And she said, I'm going to leave you there. This is the, I don't know what else to do with you. And, uh, that's where I had the shouting match with God about uh, screaming at God, cursing at God. Why won't you fix me? Why won't you change me like everybody else? And the very first time I ever heard God's voice was in that moment when he said, you have to forgive your father. And I, and I asked God, I was like, how in the hell am I supposed to do that? Wow. After what he did to me, after what he did to my mom, like, how am I supposed to do that? And he said, because it happened to him too. And for the very first time in my life, I had compassion for my father. And I started to understand, you know, not, I started to have sympathy for him. And it allowed me to, to not only forgive him, but also it got me in a position where I was begging my father who had died a couple of years before from a metastatic, uh, he had melanoma that got in his brain and all over his body. He suffered greatly. And, um, I started begging my father for forgiveness because not only did I hate my dad, but I, I showed up late to my own father's funeral an hour late high on cocaine because I'd partied all night before. And, um, I made a mockery of his funeral and, um, completely disrespected my father's name. And, uh, which is probably the ultimate sin you can do to your own parent, whether you hate him or not. 
But it was through having compassion that I was able to forgive him. And through forgiving him, I was able to get forgiveness myself. And that set me on a path to understanding just how important truth was. But because I had so many secrets, um, you know, the H- having HIV, um, being, I was the two things I kept secret. Like I would talk about having disassociative identity disorder, which is also known as multiple personality disorder. I would talk about being in jail six times, but I would only talk about the four other times going to jail because I got arrested seeking a prostitute, the fights with the cop, the, 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 the other fights, uh, you know, the DUIs. But I, I was hiding that I had HIV. I was hiding that I, um, two of the times that I'd been in jail were for domestic violence. And one thing I've learned is that God doesn't bless lies. And 98% of the truth is not the truth. And I couldn't figure out why I was, like, I, after I turned my life around, I was still struggling to make it. Like, I'd get to the finish line. I would raise, I would raise millions of dollars for a film, but I wouldn't get paid. Or I would take a consulting job, and they would take my idea, they would make fun of my idea, fire me, not pay me, then take my idea and go on to make millions of dollars. Huh. And I'm like, why, God? Like, why is this happening? And... Um, one of my friends had reached out to me. I had a, I had a four day meth relapse. Um, it was about three, almost three years ago now. And it was a four day meth binge. And God came to me at the fourth day I was getting ready. I'd given up. I said, I'm done. And I was going to go all out and just try to die, but die partying on drugs. And the fourth day God came to me and said, I'm not done with you yet. You're not going to like this. This is going to suck. <laughs> but I'm not letting you go. And I'm like, what? He goes, I want you to put a spotlight on your shadow world. And the way I interpreted that was you have to be, you have to let expose everything. No more secrets. You can't hide anymore. You don't, you don't get that luxury or that benefit anymore. You get to live your world in the spotlight. So if you screw up, if you have a relapse, you, you cheat, you, you do whatever, you're going to talk about it on your show, Gratitude Unfiltered. And at that time, my talk show was called Morning Gratitude. So he changed me. Like I had to kill this show that was successful and start a new one called Gratitude Unfiltered, which was about putting a spotlight on my shadow world to expose everything. And boy, did I. Um, And then right after that, five days in a row, God sent me five different people. Two I knew, three I didn't to all give me the same message. And that changed the course of my life forever. And I built, I literally built my life, my career, my brand, whatever you want to say, but it's all been built on putting a spotlight on my shadow world. And I have learned just so how powerful truth is. Truth, when they say the truth will set you free, I don't think many people realize the depth and the power of that statement because God will use everything that we give him. But if we're keeping it a secret, God can't use it. So I started releasing everything and talking about everything. Very, I mean, my personal testimony that's public is one of the craziest, darkest, scariest (laughs) testimonies that I've ever heard in my life. And it's my own. Like I can't even process Oh my gosh, that was my life. Are you kidding me? Because I'm so far removed from that world now, other than the multiple, like dealing with the multiple personality disorder, but I'm far removed from that world now, that darkness, that evil. But like telling that story is like, oh my gosh, that's me. And then other than taking HIV medication, like I I just can't even believe that that was my life, but it was. And, um, but I'm so blessed and so fortunate to know that those secrets that were killing me, once I released them, have been used to be able to help people. Like, I am so honored when people call me and go, I need to talk to you, and you're the only person I can talk to because you're the only one that will get it. And it's somebody that found out that their partner had a, has HIV or they have HIV or wow. they're struggling with the same mental uniqueness, as I like to call it, because as crazy as it sounds, having multiple personality disorder to me is actually a blessing. Like I look at it as a gift. It's a, in a way it's a superpower. And, um, 
And I know I'm not naive either. I mean, I deal with consequences and so does the woman that loves me, but I do look at it as a superpower. And, um, and by speaking about these things, it's opened the door and created the space for even women who get abused and they've dealt with narcissists. You know, I've created the space for healing because I've talked about it openly and honestly, and now people can call me and ask for advice and I'm able to help them in ways that others can't. So I'm truly blessed for that. So I've truly, truly learned the supernatural power of truth and how powerful it is. But I used to be so fearful of it that it was, it, it was insane. I mean, my whole life was a lie. Hmm. And now I can't help but tell the truth. Wow. That's a story. <laughs> I try to be as short as possible. I just let you go. <laughs> yeah. I didn't want to interrupt you because it was good. But it was just a lot of stuff that, I mean, I can relate to some of it as well. But um, it's the upper middle class family and the whole facade, right? And and they go to church and you think everything's beautiful and the family and many families are, are like this. But inside is just turmoil. And it, it, it you hide everything. You hide the abuse. You, you don't want to come public with it. You know, what's going to happen a lot of women get battered and they don't say anything because they're scared about their family. It's going to be destroyed. They just stay in these abusive relationships and, you know, you go to church and you think everything's okay, but it's not, it's not okay. <laughs> you know, and you know, you do that for, to a kid at a young age that it's going to affect them for the rest of their life. Cause they just, they're, they're molding and they're shaping and you, they see this stuff and this thing happens and they're just confused. And unfortunately they go down the wrong paths, but you've, um, you've cut, you were saved, right? Um, yeah. a lot of people turn to God, they turn to the Bible, Jesus, and it's what saves them. And, um, you know, I I believe there's a God, you know, things just don't happen. We don't have everything just fall into place and trees grow at a certain rate and birds fly and stuff like that. This is a God. Okay. I don't know. This is what I believe. And a lot of other people believe it too. But, you know, about the father too. I mean, I I guess you confirmed that he was abused as well, right? Um, Mm -hmm. Was that the case? Yeah. And and I mean. Yeah. And I didn't even know that. And, but when it came, when I heard it, I was able to verify it later. Like, yeah, this happened to him. And I'm like, oh, I knew his mom and father were abusive, but the sexual abuse part, I didn't know. Wow. But I found out after I got out of jail that that had actually happened to him, to my aunt. Wow. So it gave me a whole new understanding for my father. I know. I mean, I have my father too. He lost his father at a young age. You know, he was like 12 or something and, and he was the oldest uh, male in the family. He was in Italy and then uh, lost the father and then the, it was just the the mother there, right? And, you know, they don't get remarried. It's just her and now she has like five kids. And then she was, I guess, was an angry woman from what I remember. I mean, she was very caring and loving, but she did have an anger streak and I think she must have passed that down to him because he was a very angry father for us as well and I had to deal with that mostly it was verbal abuse mostly but you know when I could see where he came from like a lot of stuff clicked and I'm like all right now I got it like why is he acting like this and and I know now and uh, you have to forgive him I guess uh that's in the end you know I mean that's what Jesus says and well, that's and that will this is a process and it's a journey yeah it is a journey. You can't just flip a switch. I mean, there's no. a lot of stuff that happened, especially for you. And because of that, because of that shit that you went through, all this other stuff happened. And like, how can you forgive someone? It's a process, like you said. And and you know, um, uh, the truth, right? Shining lights on shadows. I hear that. That that's such an awesome thing. You know, I mean, you're you're put a spotlight on your shadow on your shadow world. And a lot of people keep a lot of things, um, you know, quiet, like the, you know, the church. And um, it's very important uh, to just bring that stuff up and and you you just feel a whole whole lot better, you know, when you put it out there. And there's a lot of stuff that I say on this podcast and what I've been through in the past couple of years, you know, a whole divorce and 
had a house, had the kids, had everything. It was beautiful. And then the whole thing just fell apart and just burned to the ground. And um, But I, I kind of bounced back. I guess there's two paths you can go. Either go in a corner and put a mask on like COVID or you could just jump up and go forward, <laughs> learn from it, and re- rechannel that stuff, and and you know go forward and try to help other people, and that's what that's what I've I've chosen to do. So, um, wow. And how are your sisters now? I mean, you, you're still in touch with them, or? Well, so I didn't talk to them at all. And God, I had so many freaking nightmares when they left, and I always saw them in my dreams, and I didn't see them for. 20 I didn't talk to him for over 20 years and then finally saw them right around when my father was starting to dwindle down and I, with the melanoma uh, I got to see my youngest sister who I was closest to then saw my oldest sister saw them a few times and um, reconnected my youngest sister who my father was re- the level of inappropriate, inappropriate's inappropriate. Like he didn't molest her, but he was inappropriate. Um, and it was enough to freak out the mom and, you know, make them leave. And I, I learned the true side of the story. It was inappropriate. Um, I don't, uh, but I can't really say if it was worthy or not of, of them being separated from us for a lifetime. Mm-hmm. But we reconnected. Um, my, she was able to connect with my father, get some healing, the oldest sister came to the funeral um, and the youngest didn't. But after the funeral, we have not spoken or seen each other at all. And I think no. I'm just a reminder of, of, of memories they don't want to deal with. For me now, when I see pain or I see an uncomfortable situation, mm-hmm. I know the promises of God that are behind that. Kind of like the David versus Goliath analogy. I look at obstacles or problems as a gift that we get to face so we can overcome it. I believe that we are promised and given everything we need to overcome everything that is in front of us in the victory that's behind it. Like I'm addicted to that challenge now where I don't look at it like, Oh God, here we go again. Like I, I look at it as, Oh, this is a promise. Like the answer to my prayer is on the other side of facing this giant. Not everybody's like that. And, and a lot of people give up after conquering one giant and they think they're done or they get comfortable. For me, I understand that every time you pray and ask God for something, you're going to get something to face. You're going to have to overcome it because new levels, this TD Jake says this, I, I'm not coming up with this, but TD Jake said, new levels bring new devils. And man, is he, <laughs> he is so right about it. But we are given everything we need to be able to overcome, to slay those dragons. And, and so I'm addicted to that, but they haven't taken that on yet. They haven't, they haven't gone on that, that healing journey. So it's hard for me to, to judge that, but I do hope that we will all be connected at, um, reconnected again. Well, that's great. I mean, the, the, the only thing you can do is, you know, make yourself stronger. You can't, um, control people and what they think and what they do. I mean, you could be there and say, I'm here for you. You know, when you're ready, I'd love to, to, to reconnect with you and, and be with you. And, you know, cause you're my blood, you're my sisters and families get torn apart and Mm. it's a horrible thing. But, um, I mean, but you're on the right path. I mean, you've, you've, um, you know, you've, you've, you've looked at your stuff and you're, you're dealing with it, you know, and you're also helping a lot of other people too. Um, and now uh, the fear, I mean, I want to touch upon something. I don't know if it's too personal, but we're, but you told us everything anyway, but so anyway, I might might as well go for it. The HIV, right? I mean, I don't, how, how, like, when did you learn about that and how does that, how did that impact you and how are you dealing with that? I found out about it when I was in LA. So it's been four or five years and, uh, when I found out I, instead of going, okay, I'm going to get healthy and defeat this. Like this is, no, this is before that I I found the Lord uh, or gave my life to the Lord. I went on a drug binge. Like you would never imagine. Like I was pushing it to die. Um, God would not kill me. Multiple overdoses um, disappear for weeks at a time. 
uh, I, I was literally, I was doing everything I could to die and God wouldn't take me. And, um, but then the girl that I was seeing at the time came back into my life. The one that we went to jail together. Um, she came back into my life and I decided that I was going to go to the doctor. I was going to get the medication. I was going to start living healthy. And, uh, so I did, and I, I became undetectable very quickly, which means that you cannot transfer the virus. The medication now is so good. It's even better now than it was. If I, I mean, like when I started taking it, now they have a new medication. Uh, one of my friends is just started taking, I just found out about that literally like last night. But um, that, the medication so good that literally like my health, it was a, almost a miracle. Wow. My entire, I had abu- I'd done so many drugs, like all of my vital organs were just not functioning. I well, mean, I was pooping blood as, as gross as that is. Um, I couldn't, I, I, I get my, like, not just my teeth, but like, like everything around me was just rotting. I was rotting inside. Wow. And, um, but I didn't care. <laughs> like, that was the thing. I didn't care. I wanted to die. But uh, it all changed now. So I, it all changed. I got back on my, you know, started to do good again, uh, got on a path. So we decided, and we hurt when we got back together, we decided that we were going to celebrate by, you know, doing more drugs and drinking. Yeah. And that's when I went to jail the sixth time. So that after that is when I gave my life to the Lord. Like that's the correct timing of how all that went down. Mm. And, and after that happened, um, I was on a mission and I knew like part of my surrender was saying my life is no longer my own because I tried it my way. I tried white knuckling. I tried reading all the self-help books. I tried Buddhism. I tried all of this different stuff and it never worked. But my experience with the Holy Spirit in prison in jail, I'm sorry, LA County jail, that experience was so supernatural that I, I, I honestly, you could be threatening to behead me. Like I get of ISIS outside my house right now going, okay, we're going to get you believer. You're going to denounce Jesus. <laughs> and I'm like, I can't, I can't deny what happened because it physically altered me. Wow. And, and I can't, I couldn't deny it. So, but it changed everything for me. So the HIV Part of that commitment when I realized that I got more comfortable talking about it publicly, and I, and I, I kept it secret for a while, but that, that talking about it publicly, it not only released me, it released the other people in my life that were keeping it a secret. Like our secrets hold other people hostage and keep them imprisoned too. Mm-hmm. It's not just us. So when I got comfortable talking about it, 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 it gave me more strength. And now I can talk about HIV without, I can talk about side effects. I can talk about, I can talk about all of it. I can talk about how it happened. Like I have no shame about it. And mind you, I get a lot of hate for it. Like it's not exactly like people applaud everything I do with, uh, when I talk about HIV. I have a lot of people that hate my guts. Why, why do they hate your gut? Person. Well, why? You know what? Why, do, why does anyone hate? There's something no, with themselves, something, religions. something in them, something in them. It's not about me. No, like, I'm a painful mirror for a lot of people. Mm. <laughs> so when I, when you get, when people get comfortable with truth and they just walk around going, I mean, this is it. This is honest, you know, and even talking about, I can be on stage when I'm, when I was um, doing gratitude unfiltered in front of a live audience right. uh, at a church in Oklahoma city, word of God church on Saturday night, I would talk about the, the, like the, the sexuality, like so openly that it freaked people out in the congregation because when you're molested by men, I'm sorry, it's going to either make you, it's it's going to split you or your personality one way or the other. And then it's going to cause a type of sexual confusion or an anger or hostility. Like I'm either going to become a bigot you know, gay basher, or I'm going to be like kind of curious about what happens. And, and 
And of course, drugs made all that exploration a lot easier. Mm -hmm. But I battled my sexuality hardcore for well over 25 years. Like I didn't know what was real. And again, the drugs didn't help, but yeah. that was my reality. Mm. And you know what? I know so many ministers and preachers that if they talked about their real mental health struggles <laughs> or they talked about their sexual battles, <laughs> yeah. if they were honest about it, they would set so many people free, but instead they are shamed or, or, or other people shame themselves over those struggles, not understanding that it's a very real thing that needs to be discussed. And here's yeah. the here's the craziest thing about all of it for me, with especially around sexuality and HIV. I used to seek women, bro, like women that I could convince to like you know, uh, where we I could I would try to convince them to be able to bring other men in the bedroom and like we would do our drugs and we would party and we would have our crazy sex. Like I would seek this out. When I finally met somebody that just loved me for and loved all of my personalities and accepted it and loved it and loved me, like truly, truly loved me, do you know what happened? The desire for all of that went away. <laughs> like it completely disappeared. When I started truly loving myself and had people in my life that loved me, hmm. all of a sudden I didn't want that anymore. I can't explain it. But that's literally my reality as I speak to you today. But I'm still always going to be very open about the sexuality side of it because it matters and people need to understand it. People need to know what the truth is and what it looks like, because if we can get comfortable talking about it, we can heal because a lot of like, I think, look, some people are born gay and whatever the science is, it is, but some people learn it from behavior. Some people learn it from abuse. Some people learn it from just doing drugs and running out of things to put their penis in. I'm just saying I speak about it openly because I want to give permission for other people to be able to be honest too, because it's only through truth that we will heal. Absolutely. I, I believe that. Yeah. I, you know what? And I, I brought up the Lewis house, right? You heard of Lewis, right? And he had oh, that yeah. similar um, issue. He got abused, um, sexually molested, I guess in a locker room or something like that. He was an athlete. And that happened to him and he kind of kept it under, you know, secrecy for a long time. And then he came out with it. I think he was at a seminar or something and, and he just came out with it and, and he's just started crying. And then ever since then, he's just built a whole big uh, following around that and just trying everybody to get to, to become, you know, just the truth, you know, and, and a lot of the congregations, they just want to, you know, have blinders on and just that's one way and, they probably hear what you're saying and they're like, crap, that, you know, that's me. <laughs> or I have something in there that's part of me because you went through a lot of stuff and they don't want to deal with it, so they reject it, which is not very healthy, you know, for them. Then if they don't deal with it, then they pass it on to their kids. There's this thing called covert depression, right, which mm -hmm. I was diagnosed with as well, right? What happened to the, the father passed on it passes on generation to generation and it affects kids and you got to break that shit you gotta just stop it right you know and I, I have really tried to do that with my girls i have three girls and i you know i'm just conscious of what the hell i do and if i get mad at them or something like that i'm like idiot what the hell did you just do yeah. go and apologize to them you know and i do and i said i'm sorry and and you know they they say, Dad, you know, you've changed a lot. <laughs> you you know, uh, and they want to be around me, you know. I mean, and I, I've just tried to, you know, get rid of that crap. And you have to face all your fears. You have to face them. This is what it is. It's fear. Everything boils down to fear. I'm sorry. And that's why I say them doing crushing your fear. Someone's scared of something or they don't want to deal with the truth, right? Oh, for sure. And that's what it is. You know, and that's why a lot, a huge amount of problems come about. You know, so it's just, um, but you're doing great now. And what about your organizations? Like you have the um, Live Mana Worldwide Foundation. What about, tell me about that. What's happening with that? So we have two, it's it's really what it is. It's kind of a mothership of, of various interests, but it's originated. It's a nonprofit media organization. Um, we are developing a youth outreach program 
uh, basically to be able to equip. So we work with ministries and nonprofits, but my passion is the youth. And because I recognize through Gratitude Unfiltered how healing truth was. And one thing I know about kids is if they are in a safe environment, they're going to spit the truth. And so not everybody has the calling to broadcast and be a brand, but we've come to this self, you know, obsessed where we're all on camera, we're posting, everyone's doing lives of, on all social media. There's a lot of kids that are now g- coming into this world where they're going to have to start looking for jobs and the jobs that they could qualify for will not be there. Whether, you know, how long this COVID thing goes on. Anyway, but there's a lot of people that the only hope they really have is to be a brand. And we want to, we, what we are doing is building out the multimedia broadcast platform, which means radio, TV, podcast, social media, and the transcriptions to create published blogs or published articles. And basically teach the youth the ministries and nonprofits how to monetize their message. When you lose your congregation, you lose your ability to fundraise. Or if you can't throw an event, a party to raise money, what do you do? So we are Mm -hmm. teaching them through the digital multimedia platforms how to be able to monetize those messages, to be able to raise money, to create products and brands or products uh, and other things that they can sell along with their message to bring in revenue. Um, I learned how to do all of this when I was homeless. And um, it was a great, it was just a right after being homeless, had no money. But for some reason, like I, I got this vision And it all made sense to me. And so I just spent all of this time in front of a computer learning how to do all of the different things that were needed. And, um, and it was, it was life changing for me. And a lot of people charge $10,000 to, to, to learn how to do this stuff or to have this done for them. God put it on my heart to do it as a ministry. Um, but when I got the vision for it, I knew nothing about media. I knew nothing about, I never, I'd never even held a microphone. And so I, but I could see it clearly Mm. (laughs) how to do it. I just had had no experience with it. And it's so funny, the journey that we go on, because I ended up in LA from Oklahoma. I had a skincare line that got me into sponsoring events, which got me into producing and like little by little, I started learning all of these different roles in, in entertainment, TV, film. Um, and so, and I learned product placement. So I learned all sides of the media business and how it worked. And so, and I learned that all through service. I didn't learn it by paying for a course. I learned it through serving. And so I really, when COVID hit, God said, go. And that's when we officially have formed the nonprofit I'm so blessed to have the most amazing partner with Jessica, uh, not only in love, but in life and in business. Yeah. And, and since we've formed this organization, we ended up getting our own broadcasting network. Uh, we partnered with an, a network called E360 TV, which we got their technology. They, they donated the technology to us. So, so we have our own network that broadcasts on all mediums, Apple TV, Roku, all wow. of social media. We have our own podcast network. But the other part of it was not only do we have this global mission and we are working with ministries, nonprofits and individuals all over the world, but in our community here in Minneapolis, we have an outreach program where we work in the community to help start healing the land here, not only working with the homeless and providing warm, uh, you know, warm meals, clothing, we're working on shelter options right now, but the biggest part is the fellowship and actually spending time, not just passing out food, literally sitting down in their homeless camps, hanging out and treating them like human beings. And we've become friends. Like we text and call, uh, we have them have a few of them that just call us like we're friends now. And we we are working on developing. We, we, we have the vision for it. We're working on gathering everything that we need to be able to put this plan in action for the homeless that will provide a rehabilitation program for them. That is Jessica's, um, Jessica, under Jessica's leadership, we are doing that. She runs that. I kind of handle all the media stuff, but this outreach is her leadership and I'm there in support of her. 
But I will tell you, for all of the joy that I get with helping on the media side and getting to help make people's dreams come true, the most heart-opening thing I've experienced is working in the trenches with Jessica, with the homeless population and the rest of the community here in Minneapolis. And with this program, we are going to duplicate it and we're going to have a proof of concept that we're going to take to Los Angeles and San Francisco and Dallas and Miami and New York, wow. London and so on. Cool. And implement this because we believe that it will re- rehabilitate lives. That's awesome. What a, what a journey and what a, uh, <clears throat> a great thing that you're doing now for these homeless people. You know, there's a lot of stuff. The people are homeless. It's not just like they don't want to be there. There might have been something happened to them. <laughs> like there's something that happened to them that just shifted their mindset and then they just became homeless or, you know, some bad, bad luck that they just can't. And then they just drifted into this position that they're at now. They're human beings, you know, I mean, but you have to take care of them and, Mm-hmm. A lot of cities are not doing that, and um, you know it's very honorable that you guys are stepping up and doing that, and and just you know now they're your friends. That's awesome, you know, and uh, that's cool, um, man. But listen, I, I want to. We've been talking for I said thirty minutes, and it's like almost forty minutes. So I want to. I want to kind of kind of wrap it up. But how can people? Um, get a hold of you and uh you know if they want to learn more about what you're doing or you know i think you have a probably a foundation or yeah well, how can they do yeah, that um you can go to livemanaworldwide.org and that's l i v e m a n a worldwide.org or just look up joshua t berglund um on social media i'm all over the place. I'm kind of hard to not find. <laughs> yeah. So. I found you on LinkedIn. So yeah, you're, you're like all over. You got, that's, that's awesome. Wow. 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 I appreciate you being on. You have an awesome story. You've come through a lot and I appreciate what you're doing. You're, you're helping the homeless and you've, you've given, I, I think everybody who's listening to this, a lot of good information and, and something to think about, right? The truth. The truth of such is free, right? That's what you said. I mean, but it's so true. It's like a cliche thing, but it's... If everybody was just, like, honest about stuff, imagine this world. Unbelievable. Oof. Imagine. It's the only way we'll heal. It's the only way that this world will ever heal is with truth. Yeah, I'm it's, with you. There's so much lie. There's so many lies and deception. Uh, you can't even listen to anything any of these candidates say because they're lies. And they're like, how stupid do you think we are? I just heard you say the opposite two weeks ago. Like, come on. We're it not is. that dumb. No, people are smart and they see through this crap that's happening. And, you know, they, they thank just God. thank God. <laughs> and, and, you know, eventually, you know, we'll, we'll, I'm hoping everybody can come together and we, uh, you know, move forward. But um, I appreciate you being on again, Joshua. Yes, sir. Thank you for everything uh, that you've done and you're doing. It's fantastic. And we will, we'll meet one day. Absolutely, man. Will, man. God bless you. Thank you so much. God bless you. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah, that was Joshua Berglund, uh, the chairman of Live Mana Found- Worldwide Foundation. He calls himself the world's mayor. He's a good man. He's gone through a lot of stuff. Wow. more Everybody I get on just blows me away with their stories. I mean, I haven't been through a tenth of what they've been through, but um, it's it's great to just uh, listen to what they've been, th- you know, what, what has happened and how they overcame that, right? We can learn a lot from it. Especially like you see everybody, the facade, you know, think it's a perfect family with a picket fence and everything's great, but, you know... Watch out for what's happened internally, you know. A lot of families are like that, and, and they just got to come come clean with all that stuff. And, and the truth, the truth, right? Put a spotlight on your shadow world. Shine a light on those dark corners. And just come out and, and fix fix it. Or at least try to fix it. Or at least fix yourself. Sometimes you can't, you know, help other people you try but you can help yourself and you help yourself become stronger that way you can help more people which is what uh, Joshua has done a lot of man been through a lot of stuff and um, yeah that's what we have for today I hope you enjoyed it I hope you got a lot of information out of it and you you can apply it to your life Um, 
contact Joshua. He gave you his information. I'll put it in the show notes. Also, if you want to contact me, Michael at crushingyourfear.com. I'd love to talk to you. If I if I can't help you, I will point you in the right direction and make sure we get you the help you need. Um, but everybody has fear and everybody needs help. Everybody needs some kind of help. I have fear. I just keep having fear, you know, every day. It's something new. Uh, but I'm trying to learn how to deal with it. And um, that's that's all you can do. Learn how to deal with it and help others. Help others is very important. You know, help others. And there's that universe out there. There's that energy. And God, I believe in God. I mean, you can believe whatever whatever you like. Uh, it's you. Um, but there is, there is something out there that we're, um, you know, giving out to the universe. And the universe gives back to us, which is very important. All right, that's what I got for you today. I hope you have a great rest of the day. Crush that fear. And we're going to talk to you next time. Take care. Mm-hmm.